we are allowing everyone to get into the event here. Uh, we are going to be recording this, so you'll see a little pop up on your screen. You can go ahead and accept that. We're going to record it for our, our uh, viewers who aren't able to join us in real time today. So thanks for everyone. We will make sure everyone is in the room and we will get started in just a second. Okay. All right. So, hi there. Thank you for joining us for our online career webinar hosted by the University of Arizona Alumni Career Lab. My name is Lacey Nymeyer John. I am the director of the Alumni Career and Professional Development here at the University of Arizona. And I am joined by our fabulous speaker, David Petrove. And in the background, I also want to give a shout out to Lindsay Edmonds, who is our Assistant Director of Alumni Career and Professional Development. Uh, appreciate everyone's help in making this event possible. So if you've joined us before, we are really excited to have you back. If this is your first time attending one of our webinars, we offer these for free. And today we're going to be focusing on uh, career transitions and the what the why and the how of your next career change. And this is a special two-part series uh, that's really dedicated to helping you navigate and manage that career transitions. And we do these webinars free for our alumni uh, throughout the year. So you can find all of the um, upcoming events through the Bear Down Network, as well as our website. We also record all of these webinars so that you'll be able to see them on our website at arizonaalumni.com backslash careers. And also we ask that, you know, because we are in a uh, meeting structure, ask that you please uh, mute yourself just to help with sound. And if you have questions or wanna have a comment, please use, utilize the chat feature. Uh, we'll be sure to get to those questions at the end um, and allow time for the presenter to get through all the slides. We will also be able to share those slides uh, at the end for everyone too, in, in case you missed something. So let's get to uh, introducing our speaker today. We're really excited to have David join us. He's actually returning back. Uh, David was able to join us a couple years ago for a similar um, webinar, slightly different topic, but really grateful to have him a part of our alumni community. He also is a featured career coach on our website. So he offers a special discount to alumni to help them with their careers. So David, thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you, Lacey. And it's a pleasure to be here again. Yes. So well, David, you have an impressive career. Can I, can I share some of your highlights? Sure. <laughs> awesome. Well, in 2009, David founded his own company. So after a, a, a successful career in education, he founded his own company, David Petrovay Coaching, and he is dedicated to helping people figure out what they are here to do in life and then do it. So during his 20 careers as a career counselor and um, education administrator, uh, he's worked with individuals and groups to do just that. His clients are professionals across a broad spectrum of work settings who are motivated to be the best at what they do. He has presented to groups on a national, state, and local level and on work-related topics such as communication, creating attention, getting resumes, and updating LinkedIn profiles. And also what we're talking about today, which is face challenges that we face during um, uh, changes in employment. He is an author and has several published books. Uh, most recently, he published Life Between Jobs, Out of Work, but Not Out of Worth. And it's actually a number one bestseller on Amazon. So you can go and check that out. Uh, David earned his MED in Counseling and Guidance and a PhD in Education, and has a focus on career development from the University of Arizona. 
He has served four years as a member of the University of Arizona College of Education National Advisory Board and currently sits on the Career One Stop National Advisory Board and reports to the US Department of Labor. He is a certified global career development facilitator through the National Career Development Association and is also certified in Myers-Briggs type indicator steps one and two. Uh, thank you, David, for being with us today. We're really excited for this presentation. So I'm gonna turn the time over to you. Thank you, Lacey. Well, welcome everyone. And one of the first things that I wanna do in this presentation is actually to make a slight change in the program title because it talks about a career change. And whether or not you're aware of this, you never change your career. Your career is the sum total of all the work you have done from the first paid position you've ever held until you make the decision to no longer work. So it is just this flow of basically the next three areas. One of them is your field, and that's the industry that your work is in. So it might be education, it could be business, it could be healthcare. Below that is the occupation that you hold. So let's, then this requires specific training to perform the expected tasks resulting in a payment of some type for you. So if you're, let's say in education, you could be a teacher as your occupation. If you're in business, it could be an accountant. If you're in healthcare, it could be a doctor. Then finally, your job is the, a piece of work that you perform for some type of pay. So if you're a teacher, it could be preparing lessons. If it is a, an accountant, it could be doing accounts receivable. If it's a doctor, your job might involve doing surgery. So you really want to be aware that what we're focused on today are changes in the bottom three. You can change your field, you can change your occupation, or you can change the aspects of the work that you do in your job. All right, Lacey, go ahead and forward. So when do we typically change? So remember, we're gonna be going through these W's, this seminar around or webinar around. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So, Basically, there are five stages that people can go through. These are not the only ones that are presented, but it was the one model that I followed. So you typically start stage one, ages 21 to 25. And here you're leaving your you know, high school, college education. And this involves what motivates you, what your personality type is and what would be a good fit there and what basic skills you bring to the workplace. And you're also looking at what your lifestyle preferences are. And you really wanna think about what it would take to support that. Also part of it is whether at this point you're going to be married or single. That's the first stage. Okay, Lacey, let's do the next one. Then we move into stage two. This is really involving that first professional position where you're learning these new job skills and establishing your place within a company. And as you do this, you should be seeing an increase in your self-confidence as you become more aware of the job expectations. Let's do the third stage. Stages uh, in ages 35 to 45. So this is when you have the greatest amount of career stability and curiosity maybe about looking into a new profession or field. This is generally when you're reaching peak levels of productivity, you're being promoted, and you either can be looking at being more of a success in your current role or moving into a new position or field. Now, we used to call this your midlife crisis, but actually, if you look at it, it's very much a normal stage of career development that people go through. Okay, the next slide. Then we move into the 45 to 55 stage. Here, even a higher level of success and competence. Maybe you're taking on a mentoring role with younger employees. 
you're beginning to think about what might what life might look like after retirement, and maybe you're involved in more activities outside of work. Okay, next slide. And then finally, age is 55 plus. And this plus has really increased over time as we're, con we're continuing to live longer, where they call that the longevity factor. So here you're thinking about, not only thinking about, but maybe acting on a choice to retire. Maybe you're working in your current position, you're maybe cutting back on work hours or looking for new work opportunities. Maybe you're wanting to spend more time with your family and traveling, and then looking at maybe new interesting interests, volunteering, looking at an old hobby and reviving it. So one way to think about these five stages is an upside down U where at the bottom left, you're entering into your career. And then at the top between that 35 to 45 range, you're peaking out. And then it's not really a decline, but this is where we typically shift our emphasis from building a career to beginning to maybe downsize or rethink the work that we're doing. Okay, go ahead, Lacey. So, that's when. How about why? Why do we typically change? Okay, next slide. Okay, some of the reasons why we would look at a change would be the professional factors involved. And here, what I'd like for you to do is to look at each of these four questions and ask yourself, what would my response be to each of them? What's happening with my company currently? Is it growing? Is it uh, stagnating or on life support? And believe me, I've been in the jobs that were on life support. The next one is one that we'll revisit later about whether or not you really enjoy coming to work. And then the third and fourth one have to do with a relationship that you would have with your supervisor or manager. Overall, does this person treat people fairly? Do they tend to have favorites? Are there people who are outside that circle and feel it? And also, does this person allow a sense of autonomy? Or are they a micromanager? And how does that work for me? Okay, next slide. Along with this, for many people, they want to be able to express their creativity. Don't forget, you were professionally trained for this position. And in many cases, unless you can express creativity, thinking outside the box, you may stagnate in the position. Looking at compensation, again, as you proceed through your career, are you getting the compensation that you need in order to live the lifestyle that you've identified? Can you advance? Can you grow your skills in your current position? And does the work that you do support what you see your purpose in life as being? Now, it's interesting. We talk quite a bit about what your purpose in life. In my work over these 20 plus years, people don't really begin to understand their purpose in life until that 35 to 45 stage. And that's probably why they would be looking at making a shift in the type of work that they do and where they do it as they say, oh, my purpose in life is to leave a legacy. And what might that look like? And is the work that I'm doing now contributing to that? Okay, next slide. Okay, then somehow in, a, in addition to the professional side of it, there are personal pieces to this. So do you tend to have significant differences in how you approach situations in the workplace with your supervisor or manager? Do you tend to see things one way and they say, no, that's not the way we're going to do it. And I have run into that in the workplace. Do you feel like there's nowhere to progress? Do you feel that you're not a fit anymore with the company or maybe you were never a fit to begin with? One of the things I also use with clients is comparing the square peg in the round hole. So what you wanna be is the square peg in the square hole. 
and that would be the nature of the company that you would be working for. Are there problems that you have getting along with coworkers? It doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that you're antisocial, but if you're not a good fit, that may explain why you're having those types of difficulties. And the next two are pretty much joined together. Are you not performing up to expectations? And maybe as a result of this, are you feeling burned out? And I think clearly when you get to this point, you really want to take a look at the work that you're doing and whether or not you need to change the field that you're in, change the occupation, or possibly the work duties of the job that might take you back to being more motivated to either work where you are or look at other options. Okay, the next slide, Lacey. Okay, external factors. Everything that we've talked about is before this is really what's coming to you, okay? And also internal. Here's more external. Maybe your company is experiencing layoffs, falling revenues, mergers. You might see the top employees resigning. And, you know, right now they're talking about the great resignation and, what we're really finding out is those resignations are tending to occur at lower level positions. So your more, uh, your higher positions, like executive positions, we're not seeing as many people leaving those. So the higher your educational experience level, uh, the less likely you are to leave in terms of a resignation. Maybe there are these long closed door meetings that are occurring and you're not a part of them. And you're not even being made aware of what the content is. There are these constant reassignments to other tasks besides those that were listed in your job description. Maybe you're experiencing a pay cut or early retirements are occurring. Again, some of this at this point may be related to what's happening with COVID but you also want to take a look at whether or not COVID was there. Is some of this happening for you? Okay, the next slide. Now, another reason why you may have to consider a, a change in the work that you do is you're having constant difficulties with your supervisor, that nothing really seems to be worked out between the two of you. Maybe you're seeing your duties as being one list and your supervisor says, well, that wasn't what you were hired to do. So it's really feeling stifled in terms of your professional growth. The other thing that can happen is if you're being assigned less important duties, they're dialing back on your responsibilities. You may say, this is a red flag for me maybe being looked over for a promotion or a bonus, being avoided by supervisors and coworkers. If you're finding that people that you generally spoke to before are avoiding you, there may be a reason for that and they may or may not share with you what that's all about. Information is being shared, let's say within your team, within your company, and you're not receiving that information for whatever reason not being productive. And again, this could be the result of burnout for you. If you are in a company that provides performance evaluations, if you've had three consecutive poor ratings, you may want to look at that as their justification for you being let go. Also, not being able to discuss your job dissatisfaction you try to go to your supervisor or manager to talk about this, and for whatever reason, he or she is never available. Or if they do become available, they're only gonna give you a few minutes of their time and you'll walk away from that meeting not really feeling heard. So again, these are firings and, term and terminations. The other thing that you wanna know about this is, do you work in an at-will employment state? And uh, in doing my research, if you live in Arizona, that is one of them, where you can be let go for no rational reason, just 
you are no longer going to be working here. You may not have much recourse. At the same time, as an employee, you can quit at any time. And what's suggested is this, they still refer to the two week notice that you give your company that you're leaving just out of a professional courtesy, but that's actually not required. Now you wanna look more at what your state is telling you is involved in these at will situations. Because for instance, if you have a contract that affects at will. So again, any of these items that we've listed here could be a red flag. It could be what I refer to as the writing on the wall. And when you sense that writing on the wall, you may want to think about this is the time for me to be looking elsewhere, to be considering the type of work that I do. Okay, the next slide, Lacey. So again, on an even more personal level, look at these six bullet points. Okay. Are you a person who's looking for more family time or time to share with a partner? Maybe you want more flexibility in traveling, exploring a hobby, or just traveling in general. You want to make a difference in the community and the world. And again, this goes back to your purpose. And your purpose is, again, something that will change over time. And usually around the 35 to 45 year stage is when people think about the legacy that they would like to leave. Are you being authentic in who you are? This is looking at your interests, your values, your skills, your personality, and thinking about how these fit into the work that you see yourself doing next. And then finally, wanting that balance in life between work and a private personal life. Uh, right now with COVID, one of the biggest challenges that people are having is because they're working remotely, they're now sometimes being asked to have meetings, Zoom meetings or however it's set up in the company at 4 a.m. their time because of the other time zones involved. And in some cases, they're not finishing work until 9, 10 o'clock at night. So basically, it only leaves them with time to sleep before it's time to go and start their workday again. So that is definitely a formula for burnout. And so you want to look at what you're currently doing or what you would like to do if you're between jobs and how you want that balance to be for you. Okay, Lacey. Next slide. So here's some questions that I want you to consider because we're gonna be doing breakout rooms pretty soon. And the question is, how do you feel when you're working compared to how you feel when you're away from work? Not about what you're thinking about, but how you're feeling. Are there feelings of satisfaction, excitement, just accomplished, all of these feelings are they there when you are working? And then think about when you're away from work, when you're spending time with family, when you're doing leisure time activities. Is there a large disconnect? Of course, there are always going to be aspects of work that you may not totally enjoy. That's a given. But if 90%, 80 to 90% of the time that you're at work, you are looking at the clock and asking yourself how soon before I can get out of here. That is an indicator that you may want to be looking at doing something else. Okay, Lacey, the next slide. And then how do you feel as you face your workday? When you wake up that morning, whether it be Monday through Friday, if you have a Tuesday to Saturday or Sunday work day. How do you feel when you wake up in the morning? Do you wake up excited about starting your work day or dreading it? And this is important 
And again, these are indicators of whether or not it's time for you to look at a change. These are the whys around the, the changes that people make. Okay, Lacey, next slide. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a breakout room for to check in with, just to check in with people in the chat. Give us a one, okay, if you found the breakout discussion to be helpful. Two, no, not so much. Just be honest. Okay, seeing a lot of ones, two, maybe a little too short of time. That's always the case, Amelia. Yep, more needed, more time. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry about that, Kennedy. Okay, great. So lots of ones, the twos were around the time limits. And so again, every time we do this and we have a chat room, people are always asking for more time. And I said, we could probably, you know, spend the entire hour just on one point with discussions. And that's really the richness of being able to share it with other people. Okay, so we're going to move on now to the next slide, we've been talking about the when, the why. Now we're gonna talk about where you might wanna focus your change. Okay, so Lacey, let's go to the next slide. So here we wanna think about just company size. Would you function best in the next role that you have as a sole proprietor? which is the work that I do. I've always worked for other larger agencies. And then when I decided that I wanted to go into business for myself, I had to make a decision. Sole proprietor seemed to work best for me based upon the responses that I had to the previous questions having to do with motivation, um, having to do with compensation, the fact that oftentimes the work that I was doing was not recognized by the company that I was hired to work with. So sole proprietor works. You might want to consider a partnership. And when you do, you have to be very, very careful in the person that you choose. Um, do you want to be part of an LLC in which you have to create a board of directors? And there are requirements around that. Do you want to be hired into a corporation? maybe have be part of a franchise or work for the government. So these are the, the company types that you need to consider. So you might want to, at this point, write down which of these appeals to you, or when you review the slides, which ones you may want to do some more research on. Okay, next slide. Next one is company size. Do you see yourself working in a micro business? with less than four employees. Now this could be a sole proprietorship where it's only you and maybe you have an accountant, one other person that works with you. Oftentimes it can also be a mom and pop situation. Do you wanna work for a small company? So I did some research around small companies in Arizona and one of them is called Stotts Equipment and they sell John Deere products and they have 500 plus employees there in the Phoenix area. You might want to work for a mid-sized company, which might be, for instance, the town of Gilbert, which functions probably, you know, upwards to the 10,000 number. Do you want to work for a large company? This could be a company like Southwest Airlines, American Express, or a gigantic company that has over 100,000 employees. That could be Walmart or Amazon. And I didn't know this, but Walmart employs over 2.2 million employees in their company around the country and if they're outside the country. 
So you want to think about what company size works best for you and why. If you're a person who's looking for upward mobility, which of these would be a, the best match for you? So again, it's doing your homework around where and where you work in terms of company size. Okay, next slide. What about the location? Are you a person who wants to work locally? So it might be just within your city or town. Do you want to work in a state agency that requires some movement in terms of meetings and the work that you do inside your state? How about a national level? So if you're in the US, do you want to have the ability to move or interact with people across the country? Then there's the international factor. A number of people at all ages can now work with people outside their own country. And some of this is through travel, which is rather restricted right now. But if you look at the last location remote, a lot more opportunities in that field. And it might even be a combination of working remotely with any of these uh, within any of these other four areas. Okay, L working in France, that could be interesting. So what are the key issues for you in your decision? Okay, let's go to the next. Okay, one of the things that you want to consider is that when you make a move within a field and within an occupation, less likely in terms of the job with the, the task that you perform, you may experience significantly reduced salary. When people make a change from, let's say, the work that I was doing in education to the work that I do in counseling, there were months when I first began where I had one client per month. So I had to make a decision about if whether or not this was the right fit for me. And I decided that I was going to persevere to where my company has grown to where it is today. You may have a loss in health insurance, or there may be a gap in when you start the job to where health insurance is provided. If you have health issues, this could be important for you. Maybe there's a lack of clarity. You're not quite sure what this new position will look like. Many people are hired into a job description. Once they begin work, it doesn't match what they're doing. The company had a different plan for you. It's important for you to be as clear as possible on what you will be doing in this new area. Do you have the necessary skill sets? What I suggest people do is to go on a site like indeed.com and look up five different opportunities within an occupation and then print those out and then begin to look at commonalities in the skills that are required and ask yourself, do I have what I need in order to do this job effectively? How are, you, how are your networking skills? Are you reaching out to other people? who can assist you in deciding what you want to do and where you want to do it. And then finally, it's that authenticity. Who am I? What are my values? How does all of this fit into the work I do next? Okay, next slide. Now we're going to talk about an area that is clearly a topic to discuss, fear. Many times people will stay in the work that they do simply because of the amount of fear that they believe they would experience if they changed. And so there is the fear of change itself. That is part and parcel to being human. It would also require that you move out of your comfort zone. This would be more when you change fields or occupations. With the tasks, if it's just something that is minor, it's going to be easier for you to make that adjustment. But if you change from, let's say, going into from healthcare to business, that might require quite a bit of a change in your comfort zone. 
how about some unexpected events that would result from taking this action? Um, it might be that you haven't considered some of the other people who are affected by it. And let's say you have a partner and you're talking about a change that you want to make. And that partner says, that doesn't match what I want for my future. How would you resolve that? Risking job security. You would be starting at square one with a field or an occupation. And so you may find that in testing this out, initially, uh-oh, this was not the right choice for me. Now what do I do? This also involves financial risk, questioning the skills that you have. And then finally, looking at the barriers to employment. These you're going to see quite a bit, age, gender, ethnicity. And a lot of times when it's an older worker, they focus on the age. And what you really want to be looking at is your value add. That's how you sell yourself in your next position. What is the value that I bring that some competitor, some other candidate for this position would not be able to parlay? Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, so we have a Zoom poll for you. And these are your greatest concerns in choosing your career direction. So let's put this out there and have you list your greatest concerns as you change. You get two of the seven listed. So go ahead and answer those, and then we'll have a brief discussion before we move on. All right, we're still getting some responses, so I'll just wait and make okay. sure everyone's able to, to select their top two here. And then we can share the results anonymously. Right. Great. All right, so we're going to End the poll and share the results. Okay. So if we look at what we have as the results, the largest one is risking job security. And again, this is something that you have to answer individually. How important is this to you? And this is followed by um financial risk okay you notice what they have in common they're both risks and so you want to ask yourself if i look at myself and where i am in terms of taking risks do i tend to be at the lower end at the higher end what you want to do with these fears is you want to evaluate them in terms of whether or not they are real or imagined. You need to address the fears because they can be your greatest obstacle in moving forward. So if you have a, a fear of, let's say you wanna risking your financial security, you want to visit that and say, what does this mean to me? What information do I need to obtain that is related to this that would help me move forward in a possible change. Who might I speak to about this? Who is knowledgeable in this area? So again, that takes you back to your networking and creating a network of individuals that can assist you with addressing what these fears are. So um, let's go back to, you know, the, no, let's go back one, Lacey, to, uh, okay. So if you're looking at questioning your skills, again, 
looking at the skills that are required for that position and evaluating whether or not you have those skills and how close you are to building that skill set and what resources you might use in order to obtain those. If there are barriers to employment in terms of age, okay, again, building that statement of what your value add would be and being able to present that in your interview and also on the resume that you prepare. So there are ways to address it. Okay, let's move forward. Okay, now who is involved in your career decision? Okay, we've pretty much gotten through the W's. Okay, so let's take a look at the who's. So it obviously would be your partner. If you have children, what would the effect be on them? If you have parents or grandparents, especially if they're living in the area and you may be responsible for some of their care, how would that fit into this? What about your friends and the support network that they provide you? And finally, your pets. We often forget about the fact that they will have to go through a period of adjustment. What is their age? How many do you have? All of these people and animals, animal friends, are part of your consideration. Um, oftentimes, let's say with a partner, you may have dual careers that are involved here. So if your partner is also on a career path, what does that mean in terms of you saying, well, I want to take on a new position that is on the other side of the country? You need to have a sit down meeting with that person and work that out. Even with your children, if they're in school, what will it mean in terms of them continuing in their current educational setting? With parents and grandparents, how will caretaking look different? With friends, how will I stay in touch with them? So these are the questions that you need to be asking yourself around the who's. Okay, next, Lacey. So remember, the quality of your final outcome depends on the planning. All that we have discussed up to this point is part of the planning stage. And this is critical. We often forget to plan. We just jump right into it and say, where do I find my next job and who's gonna help me get there? Okay, next slide. Now, when you're putting together a career plan, it should contain details. It needs to be realistic and achievable. You wanna set a timeline for when you see yourself making this change. And you also want to allow for flexibility and adjustments because as we were saying earlier, there could be unexpected events that occur that you need to be ready to address. Okay, next questions. Okay, and um, let's do it this way, Lacey. Um, if you could open up the gallery so that we can see who the participants are. Yep, let me stop share here. Okay. There we go. Okay, so what I'd like to do here is if you have questions, uh, why don't you use the hand raise feature and we will respond to the questions that you have in the few minutes that we have remaining. David, we had a question come in um, prior during registration, I think would be really helpful because you mentioned networking and it says when looking at a network on LinkedIn or even the Bear Down Network, um, and you're looking to find someone and, and to connect with them, what should you include in that initial message? Or could you provide like examples of wording you know, as you're trying to, to connect and, and learn more about some of these industries? So when all, when I work with clients, when I've done these types of webinars on networking, there is only one purpose to networking, and that is to establish relationships. So think about what you would typically do in reaching out to someone 
to establish a relationship. If it's part of your LinkedIn network, you might want to go to you know, your first level and work through them and find out who they know. What we are aware of is that each person probably has at least 300 people in their network. So you multiply that by 300 times 300, okay? And that's a lot of people. So if you were meeting someone new, how would you generally break the ice with them? Well, oftentimes it's establishing trust through commonalities. What are the things that you share in common? Hey, I see that. And there's certainly enough information you can get off of people's LinkedIn profiles. Okay. Hey, I see we both have an interest in such and such. Would you like some information about that? I've been there. Like if they're a travel person and let's say they, um, they've been to Paris. Oh, you've been to Paris? Well, I'm wanting to go there. What could you tell me? Uh, what are some tips that you could provide that would be helpful? The one thing that you don't want to do is start out with, and I've seen this with LinkedIn, um, I'm looking for a job. Who can help me? Believe me, people will run the other way because they don't know who you are. There's no level of trust or relationship. With Bear Down, well, look, you already have the commonality of attending the U of A. Oh, when did you go there? Uh, were you involved in any activities other than um, you know, just going to classes? So when I was at the U of A, um, I was working full time. But at the same time, I also uh, sang with the U of A community chorus. So that would be a way of connecting with people. Hey, you know, this is what I was doing. Um, did you or someone you know belong to that group? start that out as establishing the foundation for where you want to go with this. Then the other thing that you want to do is you want to use this as an opportunity to, again, it's networking, to connect with other people. And that I find is best met, that need, through what I call virtual introductions. Hey, you know, I have, we've been talking for a while and I'm looking at the possibility of moving into company XYZ. Do you happen to know anyone who works there? As a matter of fact, I do. Would you be willing to make a virtual introduction? And if you've never done one before, they're rather simple. You just say, hey, you know, this is what uh, my friend is looking for. I think you two would be a good match. So I'm going to share your contact information and the two of you can go from there. I have found that when you use virtual introductions, you get about a hundred percent success rate with connecting with that other person. I've never had someone say, no, I'm not going to do that. Why? Because they already have a relationship with you as a connector. So that's how I would approach using LinkedIn or the Bear Down Network. Start with building a relationship with that person and then move from there to how they could be of assistance. And at the same time, don't make it a one-way street. Not only how can they help you, how can you help them? Oh, I love your little added point there of, you know, how can we serve? How can I use my skills and in, in making those connections? Um, that, that's really great advice. And I've seen a lot of success with that as well. Good. There's another question, um, Zena, she's having some sound issues, but she has a question kind of relates to the beginning of our presentation today around purpose. Um, how do we I truly identify our purpose? And if we're finding it in volunteer opportunities, um, which is serving the community, you know, and, she, and she's finding that in her community service, how does she find a career that aligns with that? Um, and what does that exploration process or strategies within the exploration process um, that she could use to help her? So being of service to others, that is definitely a purpose that people will identify. And oftentimes as we age, that becomes a more common purpose. So what you want to do is look at like a volunteer situation you're in. What is it specifically that I enjoy about this situation. 
And then you begin to craft that into where would people or where could people use these skill sets, this personality type? If it's of service to others, um, could I work in a nonprofit, which is typically about service to others? Um, are there positions within a company where I'm more of service? For instance, uh, human relations or human resources. You know, would that be an option for me? So you really want to take this information and begin to develop a profile of who you are. And that's really going to be helpful when you're networking. And it also helps with tell me about yourself. The clearer you are in who you are and what you bring to an organization, the more likely you are to be considered for a job that they have. So that's how I would begin it. And certainly it is a process that I work through with my clients because some of them arrive with, I'm clueless as to what I wanna do next. And we take them through a process of identifying what that job might be through a series of assessments. And others arrive saying, I know exactly what I want to do. I just don't know where I want to do it. So we begin exploration at that stage. But again, if you go back to the original slides, they can help you identify what that next job setting would be. I hope that helps. Was that helpful for you? <laughs> yeah, and, and I think she, you know, or, or he, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. Um, is, is also looking at you know identifying purpose because sometimes our values change and our and our expectations of work change and you know we want to find you know a space to you know use our skills that aligns with that value and with that purpose and you know kind of like what you were saying right keeping in check and keeping in mind you know what is my feeling right now in work and what's my feeling outside of work and how can I find areas to kind of fill that bucket um, and maybe it's not always in work right maybe you know we have those hobbies outside or we have our volunteer experience that helps us feel that sense of purpose and um, intention but you know it, it is hard and, and navigating like you said where our career goes and, and how our values and life circumstances change. Exactly, and it could be that, you know, one of your purposes is to accumulate enough income at the end of your work life to where you can live comfortably with the lifestyle you've identified. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? It's, it's not always about, oh, I have to have this higher purpose in life to make a change for mankind and the world. It'd be as simple as these are the needs that I want to meet. And if there's any assessments or, or suggestions that maybe sometimes you use with your coaching clients, um, you know, that you want to pass along, I'd be happy to share that in the email or on the Bear Down Network after this presentation. Yes. And I know that we're coming to the top of the hour on this, Lacey, and I see that there are still more questions. Right. So... Uh what we can do is, um, David, if you don't mind, I can take these questions down and we can um, you know, work through email and maybe pass on some of these questions through individuals that ask them. Uh, but we can also move to the Bear Down Network discussion group too. Okay, great. Some of that information, uh, if we could go to my next slides, it talks about how you can get in touch with me. Great. Let me just pull those up. Okay, there is uh, my website and also my email account and my phone number. So even though I am no longer in Arizona, I still have you know, the same information that you can use to contact me and I welcome that. Perfect. All and right. There is my book, Life Between Jobs, Out of Work, Not Out of Worth. And this is all about the psychology behind these kinds of changes. It says surviving and mastering transitions in the workplace. And I've just published a workbook that accompanies this. And this can answer a lot of questions about who you are. 
So I know Lacey uh, is going to send me a list of the questions that were unanswered, and I will do my best to get back to you on those re responses. Great. And thank you everyone for joining us today. We're right on the hour. Uh, make sure to join us next week. We have the second part of our presentation where we're going to be diving into that career plan and what that's going to actually look like. And if you want some more information, be sure to check our website, ArizonaAlumni.com backslash Career Lab. Join us on the Bear Down Network. We're always uh, posting resources and great alumni are there for you to connect with as well. And there is my email if you need to have any follow-up questions from David in the meantime. But other than that, thank you all. Bear down and go Cats.